Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, uh, Chandan Saha here from IAS. Chandan uh, uh, did his PhD at IIT Kanpur uh, okay. and has been at IAS for the past many years. Chandan's research interests are broadly in complexity theory, with, uh, uh, including substantial uh, interest in problems in the nature. This includes uh, his work on uh, arithmetic circuit low bounds, the randomization of polynomial identity testing, uh, reconstruction for arithmetic circuits, uh, etc. And uh, today is going to tell us about the hardness of equivalence sort of Tell Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's a uh, uh, thanks for the intro, uh, Nadal. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to give a talk at the TFR Theory Seminar. Um, and thanks also for the invite. So as the title suggests, um, uh, it's going to be about um, a hardness result, an NP-hardness result of a special case or the special variant of the polynomial equivalence problem. It's a joint work with Omkar um, Baraskar, Agrim Diwan, and Pulkit Sinha. So let me begin by um, defining the polynomial equivalence problem. So, and feel free to stop me anytime and if you have any questions. So, uh, we say that two po polynomials in n variables, fx and gx, are equivalent if there is an invertible n cross n matrix A such that f is equal to ga. For example, if you look at this polynomial x1 square minus x2 square, you can uh, write it as x1 plus x2 times x1 minus x2 and uh, this is equivalent to the polynomial x1, x2, where the transformation matrix A it has um, 1, 1 in the first row and 1, minus 1 in the second row, right? And it's equivalent over, uh, to x1, x2 over the field of rationals Q, right? So um, uh, it's a very natural notion of equivalence uh, because invertible matrices over reals, you can think of it as a combination of uh, rotations, reflections, and so on and scaling, uh, so which means that equivalent polynomials represent um, the same function up to a change of the coordinate system, right? Uh, so yeah, so the, here is one example of the figure taken from Wikipedia, where we are basically applying a rotation function. So a natural computational question arises at this point, that if we are given two polynomials, f and g, how fast can we check whether they are equivalent or not? I'm denoting the equivalent uh, uh, between f and g by this notation uh, with a tilde here in between, right? So how are f and g given? We will assume that f and g are given verbosely as lists of coefficients and exponent vectors. Yeah, so this is a computational problem and uh, you know, very naturally you can view it as an algebraic analog of the graph isomorphism problem. It turns out the complexity of polynomial equivalence is not uh, very well understood, uh, despite the fact it has been studied for um, many years. Uh, yeah, so let me share what we know about the complexity of the polynomial equivalence problem. It is known that over finite field, polynomial equivalence is in the complexity class NP intersection co -M. Um, but over rationals, uh, it is not even known that P is decidable, unless uh, the polynomials are quadratic forms. Right? That means both the polynomials are degree uh, bounded by two. Right? In that case, uh, we have efficient algorithms um, almost over any field that you can think of, right? including the field of rationals, um, provided uh, you have uh, access to the integer factoring oracle, then you can also get an uh, quadratic form equivalence algorithm that runs in polynomial time. But, uh, you know, the, the efficiency of polynomial equivalence uh, more or less ends at quadratic forms, right? Um, because uh, from, if you go from quadratic forms to cubic forms, suddenly the problem becomes too hard. Right, uh, it, it is at least as hard as the graph isomorphism problem, but potentially harder. For example, uh, it is known that the cubic form equivalence problem is equivalent to several other uh, 
problems uh, coming from linear algebra and algebra, right? Like the algebra isomorphism problem and matrix space conjugacy, etc. And for none of these other problems, uh, we have any efficient algorithm. And it is known that cubic form equivalence is polytime equivalent to all these uh, host of other problems. Yeah, and once again, like you know, not only P is uh, not known to be decidable over Q, even cubic form equivalence is not known to be decidable over Q. So this is more or less the state of the art uh, for the polynomial equivalence problem. Um, uh, yeah, the general polynomial equivalence problem, yeah, starting from quadratic forms, you uh, suddenly at cubic forms, everything becomes hard. So naturally people have been, uh, you know, trying to study uh, some special variants of the polynomial equivalence problem, just to get some more insight on uh, when the problem becomes hard or easy. I would just like to, uh, you know, uh, uh, comment over finite fields because the polynomial equivalence problem is an NP intersection QM, it is unlikely to be NP complete, right? So it is somewhere in between. That's why the complexity, the exact complexity is not very well known, right? So well understood. And then, uh, so, yeah. So, so if, if, we, if we have a, a more pop, uh, like a problem where you are given many polynomials, like uh, so basically what I think of is if I want to check isomorphism of ID or something, uh, like if I have given one generating set versus another generating set and I want the same matrix A which transforms one to the other, is that uh, is that known to be undecidable or is I mean is that known to be certainly hard? Like hard more hardness there is known about that. Let me understand the problem you are given uh, two ideals is it as uh, system <laughs> generators two, two finite sets of polynomials two finite sets of polynomials right and i want to know whether after this a like after transformation by one some matrix a they generate the uh, there the, is okay your question is whether there is an one a uh, that uh, maps f1 to g1 and f2 to g2 like that is that yeah, that, that could be thing, or the other thing could be when you don't have this per, like a permutation, there could also be a permutation. Uh, so, so one thing could just be that we map F1 to G1, F2 to G2, F3 to G3. That's one, one alternative. The other one also could be that uh, there is, uh, there's, uh, so I was thinking of variety that so take off, take the variety of one, like F1 to Fn, you get a transformation A, which will turn, convert it to the variety of G1 to G A. Oh, a transformation, A. I see. So, okay, so I'm not uh, sure whether this version is known to be undecidable over Z or Q. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Does it uh, relate in any way to the polynomial solvability problem? Um, so this, this is really harder. You're, you're basically, yeah, so you're, what you're saying is very natural. You're saying uh, you're given a, uh, two varieties as as ideals, and you want to see whether you know um, uh, one maps to the other, uh, one variety maps to the other via an invertible transformation, right? That's the question, right? Yeah, that, that that's one variant. Right. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. This kind of yeah. I mean, I haven't seen. This kind, you know, isomorphism problems being shown undecidable. Mm -hmm. um, it may turn out to be so over Q or Z, but I haven't seen um, so any such result for the, the isomorphism kind of problems. Yeah, so it, one, yeah, I need to think whether one can relate it uh, in any way with polynomial solubility, which is known to be undecidable over Z, right? So. Uh, but, but initially, I, I thought uh, you are, um, so uh, if one, for example, if uh, one is looking for this from special cases, like um, um, like you're given sets of polynomials and F1 maps to G1, F2 maps yeah, to G2. Yes, so, uh, yes, so that, the, for that special case, something is known, some hardness is known, but that is not undecidable. In fact, that is known even for quadratic forms. Yeah, so given instead of two quadratic form F1 and G1, if you're given sets of quadratic forms, right, F1 through Fk and G1 through Gk, and you want a common transformation, then uh, that problem is uh, sort of um, not known to be polytime solvable. Yeah, so, 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 so
right? It's kind of like cubic form equivalent. Mm -hmm. right? There's some name to it. I'm trying to recall what is the name. It's, it's being studied in cryptography mm -hmm. uh, with respect to a scheme called pattern scheme. We mm -hmm. study this variant of the quadratic form equivalent problem. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, any other question? No. Okay. Right. So uh, naturally, people were trying to look at some special variant, and uh, one such natural variant of the P problem is called equivalence testing. So let me define it. So in this case, uh, you have some class of polynomials. Let's call that C, some natural class of polynomials. And we define equivalence testing for C as follows. Given F, check if there is some G in C such that F is equivalent to G. So here we are given just one input F, right? The other input is kind of implicit. It's not given, right? You wish to check uh, uh, whether F is equivalent to some polynomial in the class and the knowledge of the class is there. So we are, uh, we want to design an algorithm once uh, the class is fixed, the class of polynomials is fixed, right? So, and in this case, if yes, then you output both the transformation as well as a witness G such that f is equal to gx. Yeah, so um, now uh, I, I'll quickly make a comment on the model of computation in this case, because P is a decision problem and the I also want A and G. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a search problem also. So here the model of computation kind of impl implicitly assumes that uh, all uh, arithmetic, field arithmetic can be done in unit time and um, we can store a field element also in units. Right? So it's like the BSS model of computation that we are showing. Right? But if you're working over finite fields, you can as well work uh, over Turing machines. Okay, so um, I'll uh, quickly introduce one uh, uh, you know, terminology here, um, which is the orbit of C. Orbit of C is defined as the set of all uh, G A X, where G is in C and A is invertible. Right, so the problem equivalence testing for C is uh, basically checking whether F is in the orbit of C or not, given F. Okay, so a natural question is for which classes uh, do equivalence testing turn out to be easy or hard? Right, so uh, as you vary the classes, for some classes it may turn out to be easy, for some classes it may turn out to be hard. So. Uh, People have studied equivalence testing for a host of polynomial families, entry symmetric polynomials and power symmetric polynomials, uh, um, all the way to some sort of polynomials, design polynomials, and, uh, determinant, permanent, IMM. IMM stands for iterated matrix multiplication, and so on. So these polynomials more or less covers all important polynomial families that are usually used in algebraic complexity. So why are these polynomial uh, families interesting? Because uh, uh, the affine projections of some of these polynomials are incredibly powerful. For example, affine projections of determinant and IMM uh, capture a very powerful class, uh, subclass of circuits called algebraic branching programs, right? Um, similarly, um, equivalence testing has also been studied for a class of formulas called read once formulas. And affine projections of read once formulas uh, capture formulas, a uh, general arithmetic formula. And I'll define affine projection formally in a few slides, but I'm just uh, noting this here because equivalence testing problem is like a special case of checking whether polynomial is um, an affine projection of some polynomial in this in a given class. Right. And it turns out for that in all these results, uh, you can as well assume F is given as a black box and still um, uh, you get efficient equivalence testing algorithms. Right? Randomized efficient equivalence testing. Efficient here means polynomial time. Mostly polynomial in the number of variables and degree. Okay, so uh, a natural question arises at this point. At, at this point. Uh, is equivalence testing hard for? some class of uh, polynomial, right? A very natural class is a class of sparse polynomials, right? Which um, are polynomials computed by depth two arithmetic circuits. 
So a depth to arithmetic circuit looks like this. It has a plus gate on top and a second layer of uh, power gate. Right? So the polynomial computes sums of monomials. Right? Or the output or the circuit computes sums of monomials. Right? So uh, as you can see, like in this uh, figure, this polynomial is 3x to x3 plus x1 square. And um, yeah, and we say that a polynomial is S sparse if it has at most S monomials with non-zero coefficients, right? In this case, in this example, um, the polynomial is too sparse. Okay, so uh, sparse polynomials have been extensively and also in computer algebra, right? With regard to identity testing or hitting sets, then interpolation, polynomial interpolation problem, polynomial solvability, right? The polynomial factoring, yeah, the, the basically trying to understand the uh, uh, the sparsity of the factors of a sparse polynomial, right? So there are still some uh, open questions on uh, yeah on factorization of sparse polynomials. But generally speaking, uh, they are uh, an extremely popular object in computer algebra and algebraic complexity, right? So and the natural question is whether equivalence testing is Hard for sparse for the class of sparse polynomials. So let me define the problem formally and also give it a name. So I will use the name ET sparse or equivalence testing for sparse polynomials, where we are given f and an integer s, and we wish to check if it f is equivalent to some s sparse polynomial, right? And uh, what is the input representation of f? We are going to assume that f is given um, in the sparse representation. That means f is given as a list of non-zero coefficients along with the exponent vectors of the monomials, right? So this is not exactly dense representation because we are not, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving the zero coefficients. Like right? that means the, uh, we are ignoring the monomials with zero coefficients, right? So, right. So uh, we will see in this talk that the answer to the question is yes, it it is indeed NP-hard, yeah. Mm -hmm. But before we go into the proof, let us at least see a couple of related works, what is known about this problem, or what was known. So uh, Grigoryov and Karpinski studied this problem, exactly this problem, um, of nearly 30 years back, more than 30 years back. Right? They studied the problem over Q and gave an exponential uh, time algorithm, uh, exponential in N time algorithm, where N is the number of days. Right? And very recently, um, Ilara, Gretzner, and Spilka, they showed an undecidable result. They showed uh, that over Z, um, yeah, uh, testing if a given F is shift equivalent to some S sparse polynomial uh, is undecidable, right? So what is uh, shift equivalent? So we say the two polynomials F and G are shift equivalent if there is a translation vector B such that G is equal to F X plus B. Notice that here, uh, the transformation matrix A is actually an identity matrix, right? And the way we define the equivalence testing, we ignored the translation vector B, but whatever results we are going to discuss uh, today, everything uh, holds with the translation vector also, but I'm going to ignore that for simplicity, right? But this second result already gives some hint, right? at least we expect, the, you know, because, they turn the problem turns out to be undecidable or is that um, with just translation. So one would expect that with uh, <laughs> if you attach uh, uh, arbitrary, if you allow an arbitrary uh, invertible matrix A, uh, it should continue to remain hard, right? But unfortunately, their proof uh, does not imply uh, uh, anything for arbitrary A. And um, yeah, so we sort of fill in the gap here. Okay. So before I uh, state the theorem formally, uh, let me at least uh, um, you know briefly tell give us give you another motivation for studying the ET sparse problem. Um, it, well, so far, what what I have told you is like it is natural because sparse polynomial is a popular uh, class of polynomials. So it is natural to study ET for this problem, but there is also a deeper uh, reason, uh, and that reason comes uh, from the connection between this ET sparse problem and um, 
what is called as the minimum circuit size problem or MCSP, right? Uh, so to uh, uh, show you the connection, let me quickly define a few things. First is affine projections. We say a polynomial G is an affine projection of F. If there exists an A, need not be invertible, and the translation B such that G is FAX plus B. And if B is zero, then we say G is a linear projection of F. For example, uh, if you see x1 square minus x2 plus x1 plus x2 is an affine projection of x1, x2 plus x3, whereas x1 square minus x2 square is a linear projection of x1, x2 plus x3. Okay, so we need one more definition, um, a couple of more definitions. So uh, the next definition is that of depth three arithmetic circuit. So just like depth two arithmetic circuit, depth three arithmetic circuit has a plus gate uh, at the root level and then a layer of multiplication gates and a layer of addition gates. And uh, the input variables are feeding into the addition gates. So these addition gates are computing affine forms, right? Uh, that's a depth three circuit, which is a very highly expressive class of circuits uh, thanks to the depth reduction results, um, um, which um, shows that arbitrary circuits can be compressed to depth three circuits without uh, mm, without an exponential loss in the size. Okay, but notice one thing, this is coming back to our discussion, that a depth three circuit, which we are going to also going to denote as sigma pi sigma circuit, sigma for this plus k, then pi, and then the last layer of sigma. So a sigma pi sigma circuit having tau fan in S is an affine projection of an S pass polynomial, right? That's because like if you forego the last layer, and feed in the input variables directly to the second layer, that's a depth two circuit, and that computes an S-parse polynomial, where S is the top fan. The so top fan is the fan in of the root node. Yeah. So um, by the formal degree of a depth three circuit, uh, uh, we would mean the maximum degree among the uh, polynomials computed by the product gates. Okay, so um, we say a depth three circuit is homogeneous, if every gate of the circuit computes a homogeneous polynomial. Homogeneous polynomial means that all the monomials of the polynomials have the same degree. Okay, so now with these definitions, we are sort of ready to pose the MCSP problem for depth three circuits uh, and homogeneous depth three circuits. So first for depth three uh, circuits, let us define sigma pi sigma MCSP as follows. That you're given a polynomial f and you're also given two integers capital D and small s. And we wish to check if there is a depth three circuit with formal degree bounded by D and top fan in bounded by S that computes F. Yeah, it's a very natural uh, you know, uh, version of the MCSP problem uh, for depth three circuit. And very similarly for homogeneous uh, depth three circuit, we uh, take input a homogeneous polynomial F and just one integer s. Instead of two integers, just take one integer s and check if there is a homogeneous depth three circuit with top fan in bounded by s that computes f. Here we are taking one integer because a homogeneous depth three circuit, uh, you know, there is no cancellation happening. So you, the formal degree of the circuit uh, needs to be the same as the degree of f. So just one parameter suffices to define the minimum circuit size problem. All right, so it's a natural uh, question whether these problems are hard or not. But before I, I uh, you know, uh, tell you more about it, uh, let me uh, make a comment uh, that in the Boolean world, uh, MCSP um, is being furiously studied for the last, uh, you know, six, seven years. A lot of uh, highly interesting progress uh, uh, has been made. Um, and it's a long-standing open problem. Uh, whether or not MCSP for Boolean circuit is NP complete. Um, yeah, and you know, so in the Boolean case, we assume that the input is given, that the input function is given as a truth table, right? And uh, there is also a parameter S given in the input, and we wish to check whether um, F uh, is computable by a circuit of size uh, at most S. But not much uh, has been studied for uh, um, arithmetic circuits, like right? uh, about MCSP for arithmetic circuit, right? So uh, what what is known, I will tell you in a moment what is known about MCSP for arithmetic circuit, but let me tell you how does the input look like in case of uh, 
MCSP for arithmetic circuits. So we'll assume that in case of arithmetic circuit, F is given in the sparse representation. Why is that so? Um, a natural, like if you want to really uh, create an analogous version of MCSP for the arithmetic world, it's natural to uh, assume that F is given in the dense representation. But, but we are assuming sparse representation for a couple of reasons. One is um, in the Boolean world, we uh, assume that F is given in the truth table form because that helps us put the problem in NP. You can efficiently verify given a circuit whether it is indeed F or not. Um, whereas in case of arithmetic circuit, uh, because of the power of polynomial identity testing, notice one thing, even if F is given in the sparse representation, you can put MCSP for arithmetic circuits or finite fields, let's say, in the class MA. Right? Because verification is uh, uh, now a polynomial identity testing problem, which can be solved in randomized polynomial time. We didn't have this flexibility in the Boolean world. So it makes sense to study MCSP um, in the arithmetic world, assuming that if is given the sparse representation, that's reason one. And reason two is like, you know, uh, because this representation is more succinct, um, it, uh, you know, it kind of raises hope that maybe we would be able to prove NP hardness result, which might otherwise turn out to be tricky uh, to prove using dense representation of the input. Okay, so, um, so in the rest of the talk, we're going to assume that F is given in sparse representation for both depth three as well as homogeneous depth three and three. Okay, so the question is, are this problem NP hard? Um, uh, first, an observation that these two problems are related to each other. Uh, you notice that um, uh, that uh, depth three MCSP is MT NP hard. Uh, if depth three uh, MCSP is NP hard, then homogeneous depth three MCSP is also NP hard. Why is that so? Here is a quick proof sketch. Um, suppose uh, you know uh, F as a uh, depth three circuit with formal degree at most G and top and in at most F, right? Then um, uh, that also means that the homogeneous, if you homogenize the polynomial F, that, uh, by that I mean that you replace every variable Xi by Xi by Z and multiply it by uh, Z part D. And this homogeneous polynomial has a homogeneous depth three circuit with top and in at most S. Yeah, and the converse also holds that um, uh, this homogeneous polynomial has a dip, homogeneous depth three circuit of any at most S, um, then um, if you uh, evaluate Z to one, then F will have a depth three circuit with formal degree at most T and top any at most S. So because of this, uh, this homogenization trick, um, it, um, right, it, it becomes necessary to prove NP hardness of homogeneous depth three NPS, MCSP um, to prove uh, NP hardness of um, depth three NP, MCSP, right? So uh, we will focus on, um, uh, for the rest of the talk, we will focus on homogeneous uh, sigma pi. Actually, I take that back. I, we're not going to focus on homogeneous sigma pi sigma MCSP. It's just for the purpose of motivation. Um, yeah, so we will deal with inhomogeneous polynomials, right? So uh, if you're curious, what about the reverse direction, that whether, homogeneous hardness of homogeneous uh, depth three MCSP implies hardness of depth three MCSP? Uh, I suspect the answer is yes. And uh, uh, although I'm, I'm not mentioning here, but uh, it so turns out that if that NP hardness proof for homogeneous, uh, uh, the hypothetical NP hardness proof for homogeneous depth three MCS MCSP, if that proof has some very natural feature, then that will also imply depth three MCSP hardness, right? So these two problems are, you know, uh, are pretty much correlated, uh, closely related to each other. Okay, so now uh, what is uh, known about uh, homogeneous depth three um, uh, MCSP hardness? Uh, two special cases are known. We know NP hardness of MCSP for two subclasses of homogeneous depth three circuit, namely depth three powering circuits and set multilinear depth three circuits, right? So, um, but uh, there's one issue uh, which makes these results uh, um, uh, a little unsatisfactory, Al although both the results are uh, very nice because the models themselves are highly important. Set multilinear depth three circuit corresponds to tensors, 
depth C powering circuit correspond to symmetric tensors. So they themselves are uh, highly important models. Um, but um, viewed in a certain way, um, it, I think it will be uh, um, more appealing um, uh, if we are able to prove NP, hard, NP hardness of MCSP for some dense subclass of homogeneous depth tree circuit, right? So what do I mean by dense subclass? Uh, intuitively, a dense subclass of homogeneous depth tree circuit uh, uh, is such that um, if you pick up any homogeneous depth tree circuit, then you can approximate that homogeneous depth tree circuit but infinitesimally closely by circuits in that dense subclass, right? So you can, uh, for example, like let's uh, say the underlying field is reals, right? So uh, then the, we say the class C is homogeneous depth circuit. Right? If I pick up any arbitrary homogeneous depth circuit, then I can approach this arbitrary circuit um, uh, via a sequence of uh, circuits in um, in the dense in the in the subclass C, right? So and then we will say that this subclass is dense, right? So although uh, put forth the intuition uh, using uh, real as the underlying field, but we can easily formalize this notion of dense subclass um, over any field using uh, direct key closure. So I'm, I'm avoiding a, a a precise definition of a dense subclass, but it can be precisely defined, right? Of course, like uh, you know, homogeneous depth C circuit as a class itself is, is dense, right? So ideally we want to prove it for that, but in the absence of uh, such a result, which is our ultimate goal, um, I think an intermediate result, which can serve as some kind of, um, you know, hint or some kind of an evidence or uh, hardness of homogeneous depth three MTSP would be a, a hardness of MTSP for a dense subclass of homogeneous depth three circuit. Right, so you now it turns out that the earlier two classes that I mentioned, they are not dense, right? But on the other hand, orbits of homogeneous sparse polynomials, they form a dense subclass of uh, homogeneous depth tree circuit. Yeah, so what, what would, once again, what do I mean by orbits of homogeneous sparse polynomial? You take homogeneous uh, sparse polynomial and then uh, apply an invertible linear transformation on the variables, right, uh, uh, as you, vary the invertible linear transformation, you get the orbit of homogeneous uh, parse polynomials, right? So that itself uh, is, a, is a subclass of homogeneous depth three circuits, uh, right? And, and it turns out that it is also dense, right? So the natural question is, is MCSP for orbits of homogeneous parse polynomials NP hard? If that is so, then that serves as some, um, you know, some evidence, right? So, um, uh, some satisfactory evidence that maybe the general problem is also NP high, right? So we'll also answer the question in the affirmative. Um, and uh, now I think um, we can, now that the motivation part is over, let us state the results formally. Yeah, so, but, but notice one thing uh, that this, I should have, you know, covered the second bullet, that um, the question two is related to question one, right? Because MCST for orbits of, homogeneous sparse polynomial is exactly the ET sparse problem on inputs that are homogeneous polynomial, right? So it's exactly the earlier problem. It is sparse, where, but the input now we are focusing on only homogeneous polynomials, right? So if you prove hardness of ET sparse for homogeneous polynomials, that itself will answer both question one and question two, right? So, um, um, Right, so here is the main theorem that there is a deterministic polynomial time mini one reduction from three sat to ET sparse over any field F, right? And uh, the theorem holds even if, the, even if F is a homogeneous polynomial, which answers both question one and two. But sort of we will do the proof today, um, assuming F is, uh, the, assuming that we are allowed to, uh, the, the reduction is allowed to output an F which is inhomogeneous because the proof is uh, uh, shorter and simpler that way. If you out, need to output a homogeneous polynomial, then the proof gets a little uh, more uh, elaborate, right? So one remark on the theorem, that the reduction has the feature that a satisfying assignment is uh, mapped to a sparsifying invertible A that um, has only minus one, zero, one entry. 
right? So, which means ET sparse is NP hard, even if you are looking at invertible transformation with minus 101 entries, right? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, which, uh, you know, whose answer I don't know, whether uh, we can prove NP hardness um, for zero one invertible uh, transformations as well. Okay. So, um, yeah, so as I said, uh, this implies that MCSP is NP hard for a dense subclass of homogeneous step three circuit. Yeah, so we are, um, also show an, uh, a gap version of this hardness result, right? So which so let me uh, uh, define uh, this uh, uh, this quantity called sparse orbit, orbit complexity. Right? We call uh, you know call the smallest S naught such that F is in the orbit of an S naught sparse polynomial as the sparse orbit complexity of F. Right. So then uh, we have the following theorem. Right. Let epsilon be some arbitrary constant uh, less than one third. It is NP hard to compute S to the one third minus epsilon factor approximation of the sparse orbit complexity when the input is given as an S sparse polynomial, homogeneous or not. Let's ignore that. Or again, over any field. Notice one thing uh, because the input is given as an S sparse polynomial. Yeah, an S factor approximation is trivial because you can just output the input polynomial, right? And what this is saying is if S is the input sparsity, then if you are trying to uh, find the sparse of the complexity, then um, the best you can do is uh, efficiently is uh, say, you know, at most three bar, S bar one third minus F L. And you can't do better, right? So, um, that's any question? All right. So um, I'll give you a, a, a you know, sort of a proof of theorem one, and if time permits, just a catchy proof of theorem two. Um, there's a third theorem. Just one more comment at this point that uh, this theorem um, does not uh, invoke the PCP theorem. It's, it's sort of a but, you know, I don't know of too many examples of hardness of approximation results uh, that are proved, uh, you know, uh, without invoking the PCP theorem. Yeah, there are a few, um, you know, maybe one is the traveling salesman problem, some version of it, right? So, uh, but this one sort of follows uh, directly from the, nearly directly from the reduction itself. Okay, uh, there's a third result. Let me uh, quickly, uh, the result, but I'm not, I'm not going to prove it. Um, so uh, see, ET sparse itself is NP hard, but um, this polynomial, the power symmetric polynomial, which is defined as X1 power D to Xn power D, it's a special case of a sparse polynomial. And there are efficient equivalence testing algorithms known for the power symmetric polynomial, the class of power symmetric polynomials. N notice that power symmetric polynomial has support one. So the natural question at this point is, um, is equivalent testing easy for constant support polynomials? I should have defined support. Support here means um, the following. Support of a monomial is the number of variables with non-zero coefficient, non-zero exponents, uh, sorry. And support of a, monom of a polynomial F is the maximum support size over all the monomials of F. Right, so, uh, so we can define um, an equivalence testing problem uh, like this, that given F and a number sigma, check if there is an invertible A and a support uh, sigma polynomial G, such that F is GAX, right? So the question is, is this problem easy, right? So um, we are able to show that this problem is also NP hard uh, for any constant sigma greater than or equal to six, right? If time permits, I'll quickly say where the six is coming from. Right, so um, so there's still a gap. It still does not satisfactorily answer uh, everything uh, because there's still a gap between one and six, right? So so before good, getting into the proofs, let me um, uh, quickly say uh, a few things. One is that all these theorems are proved via direct reductions from three set problem. And um, we'll skip the proof of this. And let me uh, state uh, a few questions whose, uh, uh, Answers I uh, we don't know at the moment, and they're all natural questions at this point. One is uh, let us begin with the last uh, theorem that uh, can we prove that ET support is NP hard for support sigma equal to two? Uh, so between two and 
five, uh, we don't know uh, whether we can do that. Um, now, the ET sparse problem, we prove it to be NP hard. Um, the, the reduction outputs are polynomial whose degree is not constant, right? So I don't know what is the complexity of ET sparse um, or constant degree polynomials, right? So if we show that it is NP hard for constant degree polynomials, then we can as well assume that the input is given in the density presentation and still the polynomial, the problem remains hard. Okay, for the second theorem, um, uh, we prove a, a, a hardness factor of S bar one minus epsilon, S bar one third minus epsilon. Uh, ideally, we sort of expect S bar one minus epsilon because S factor approximation is trivial. So here's a natural question, can we improve one third to one? Yeah. And finally, the most, uh, you know, uh, interesting problem um, right, uh, in, uh, for this talk, uh, whose answer I'm not going to provide, but I don't know, is MCSP NP hard for homogeneous depth three circuit. Because homogeneous depth three circuit has been studied um, in the arithmetic circuit world for uh, many years, and excellent lower bounds are known for, you know, huge range of degrees and uh, number of variables, right? So, but still we don't know whether it's NP hard or not. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to uh, quickly uh, get into the proofs. Uh, so any questions? Uh, all right, so how much time do I have? Oh, um, recall when we exactly, sorry? Oh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Right, so we're going to, uh, focus on characteristic uh, zero fields, because uh, for characteristic zero fields, the proof is uh, somewhat elementary and short. Uh, for other fields also, it is, uh, you know, sort of elementary, but it, it's it's not as short as uh, the characteristic zero field. Right? So we are going to skip uh, in these other cases, like what happens in the finite characteristic case and the homogeneous case, right? All right, so if, uh, one notation, by S of F, I'm going to mean sparsity of F. Uh, and I'll need this definition crucially. So we will say that polynomials F and G are degree separated if no monomial of F has the same degree as a monomial of G. Yeah, all the monomials have different degree. In, in, if you pick up a monomial in F and another monomial in G, they have different degree. But within F, there can be monomials of the same degree. Right, so it's a it's easy to observe that because there are no cancellations uh, happening among the monomials of F and G, the sparsity of F and G uh, adds. Up. If you take F plus G, then the sparsity of that is the sparsity of F plus sparsity of G. Use this basic fact uh, crucially. So now let's talk about the reduction. So we have shy, right? The, which is some uh, input to the reduction. It's a three CNF. Right, in x1 to xn variables, and it has m clauses, let's say. So without loss of generality, shy looks like this. Um, without loss of generality, I'm going to assume every clause has exactly three literals, right? So, uh, so it's a conjunction of m clauses. The clauses are indexed by k. <laughs> it denotes the set of indices of the variables in the kth clause, right? So ck is of size three, right? So so x, j, j basically varies over the variables of ck. And so if there is a, is a variable uh, appears with a negation, then this, uh, you know, the a, k, j is one, then otherwise a, k, j is zero, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so that's how a 3CNF looks like. So um, the reduction will use n plus one additional variables, some n, y variables, and one extra x variable, we call it x naught. So in total, we have two n plus one variables. Now, uh, let us uh, say d1 to d4 are some degree parameters. They are natural numbers. They won't be constant. They will be functions of m and n, right? Whose values we are going to set later in the analysis. And we will use this to define uh, for some polynomials. Uh, yeah, so let's say uh, initially we define these polynomials qi, Set, where Z is the entire set of variables. 
uh, for i from 1 to n. So basically, this qi would be standing for the variable polynomial, the polynomials corresponding to the variable. Right? So each qiz has three parts, qi1, qi2, and qi3, where qi1 is defined something like this. Right? It's OK, even you don't have to memorize it, because I'll keep the, the image of these polynomials for the rest of the talk. Right? So the, these polynomials will always be in front of your eyes. Right? So qi1 is defined like this. All the polynomials have x0 variable in common. qi2 is defined like this. Yeah? And qi3 is defined like this. Right? So qi2 and qi3 are sort of the uh, yes evaluation of the variable and the no uh, uh, evaluation of the variable. That means like one and zero. Uh, but qi1 is an auxiliary polynomial which we uh, need as a, some kind of a helper polynomial which helps in the proof, right? So, okay, so we call these the uh, polynomials corresponding to the variables, right? And let's see how the polynomials uh, corresponding to the clauses look like. So we have rk where k runs over the indices of the clauses. That looks like this, uh, you know, some x naught power something, right? Um, then product uh, with three uh, uh, linear terms, right? J goes over CK, so that means there are three terms here. Right? Yj plus uh, minus one power AKJ, where AKJ is the same AKJ here, xj power D4, right? So, uh, so let me uh, call these polynomials as the clause polynomials and uh, you know, I, I'm going to keep this, uh, you know, for the rest of the talk, right, this part, that uh, QI1, I2, I3, and the class polynomial, right? So the reduction will basically output a polynomial, which is a sum of all these QIs and the RK, right? We'll, we'll state that precisely. But before that, let me say, what, how do we choose these degree parameters, D1, D2, D3, D4? We'll choose in such a way that all these polynomials here, they are degree separated. Uh, you, you can see that the, all these polynomials that you see individually, they are homogeneous, individual. But if, if you choose D1, D2, D3, D4, such that they all become degree separated, and then if you sum it up, then the resulting polynomial is no longer homogeneous, right? So here it states precisely how uh, D1, D2, D3, and D4 are set. For example, D4 is set as M, the number of clauses, D3 is roughly m times D4 square, and D2 is twice D3. And the sparsity parameter S, which the reduction is going to output, it looks like n times D3 plus three and m times D4 plus one square. And only D1 is remaining to be set. We set D1 to S itself, this S, yeah? So notice one thing, the way it is defined, D1 is the larger, then D2, then D3, then D4. And this is how the polynomials look like. And now, um, yeah, so I'm not proving it, but it's easy to verify that if you use this such a setting, and this is not a unique setting, there's several other ways to set the uh, the degree degrees in such a way that the polynomials become degree separated for all i and k. Right, so now uh, let me keep a record of the uh, way the d1 to d4 are set and also the sparsity parameter s. And so this part uh, uh, will remain constant in the remaining slides. Okay, so now the final F of the reduction is the sum over all the variable polynomials and all the clause polynomials. Notice that the sparsity of F is, because everything is degree separated, the sparsity will add up, right? So sparsity of any one QI, if you see, that would be the sparsity of these three polynomials, qi1, qi2, and qi3. Sparsity of qi1 is one. Sparsity of qi2 is, if you expand this, it is d3 plus one, then another d3 plus one. So we get two d3 plus two plus one, right? So that's why two d3 plus three times n, because i goes from one to n. Yeah, so these, this part of the sparsity comes from the variable polynomials. And this part of the sparsity comes from the clause polynomial. So let's see how does a clause polynomial look like. And because all the variables are distinct, right? So across the, because we have assumed that every clause has exactly three literals, all the very three variables are distinct. If you unravel this product, 
you get a polynomial whose sparsity is d4 plus one whole square, whole cube, not square, there are three terms, whole cube. That is for one clause. So we have m clauses. So this is the total sparsity of f. So that's the input sparsity, the, the sparsity of the input, uh, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say input, that's the um, sparsity of the output of the reduction, f. And the parameter s has got to be less than the sparsity of f. So we set it like this as before, right? As, as you can see, it is uh, significantly less than the input sparsity, right? And the deduction maps chi to this tuple, f comma s, right? And um, you know, observe that the way we have defined f, the support of f is seven. And in a way, this is responsible for the, uh, the hardness result for uh, ET support. Right, so, okay. So um, what, what do we want to show? We wish to show that chi is in three sat if and only if f is in the orbit of an s sparse polynomial, right? So let's uh, look at the forward direction, which is easy. So let's say u is some satisfying assignment of chi, right? Then, uh, the, sorry? I have a question. So yes. I can see why uh, all these QI ones, QI twos, QI threes, and RK are degree separated. But you also sum over all the different RK. Why are why are those degree separated? Why why are they? Why are the are separated? Separated? Mm -hmm. because of the K here? Because of the K here. Oh, you I see. The K? Yeah. Uh, so we use the X naught variables basically uh, the helper to uh, separate out the degrees. Okay. Okay. So uh, the forward direction says that if you start with a satisfying assignment of chi, then uh, sparsity of f is it. That means f with a applied on it would be strictly less than, not strictly less than, less than equal to s. Where a is as follows. A is defined like this. It maps x naught to x naught and xi to xi. It acts as an identity on the, all the vari x variables. But on the y variable, it, it looks like this. It takes yi to yi plus minus one power ui, where ui is the ui here of the assignment times xi. Now it's very easy to uh, show that uh, you know sparsity of f az would be less than s, right? So let's see this. Uh, what happens to qi one? It remains sparsity one. What happens to qi two and qi three? You see, uh, this is either plus one or minus one. So one of them will have sparsity one, the other will have sparsity d3 plus one. So if you look at the sparsity of qi az, that will be d3 plus three for one particular i. So, and if you sum over all n, you get n times d3 plus three. Now let's look at uh, uh, rk, what happens to rk? Now you see, uh, as the kth clause is satisfied, every kth clause is satisfied, right? So let's fix a k. So in that clause, uh, it must be the case that some literal has evaluated to one. When can this happen? This can happen only if uj is different from akj. For example, if akj is zero, that means the variable is appearing as it is, and, and that is given value one. That means, you know, u, ui is one, right? Uh, so only if uj is different from akj, yeah, then uh, the clause is satisfied. And if that happens, then one of the linear factor will collapse to just a single variable or a, a, or a scaling. The other two might remain. So the sparsity of rk with a applied on it would be less than d4 plus one whole square. And uh, uh, you know because a is a linear transformation, uh, you know the, the degrees remain the same even after applying A. So again, all the, the sparsities will add up over all M clauses and we get M times D4 plus one whole square, right? So this is a forward direction easy proof that if there is a satisfying assignment, that there is an invertible transformation and it's easy to see that this transformation is invertible. Yeah, this finishes the forward direction. The reverse direction is more interesting. Right, so uh, to prove the reverse direction, so the, what, what is the reverse direction? We assume that there is an invertible A such that uh, sparsity uh, comes down to less than equal to this S. And from there, we wish to show that there is a satisfying assignment for shy. You know, for that, I'm going to use this easy claim. Uh, uh, the claim says the following, that if G is a non-zero polynomial, 
divisible by L power D for some linear form L in at least two variables, then R C T of G has got to be at least G plus one. This theorem, this claim holds only over characteristic zero. Over other characteristic, we don't, we can't use this claim. Uh, we have to use, uh, you know, something similar, something else, not exactly this, right? So uh, I've given a proof sketch here, but because you know I don't have much time, let me just skip the proof. Skip the proof and just remember the claim here, um, and and let's see what it, it uh, uh, does, uh, how it helps us. So now suppose there is an A such that sparsity of S is it is less than S. Yeah. The first claim is, or the first lemma is, that without loss of generality, we can assume that such an A maps X naught to X naught. Why is that so? Because you see the way the polynomials f is defined, you know, i can be the what's the smallest value of i one, right? Then then I get x naught power d one, right? That means x naught power d one divides f, which means a x naught a x naught is the linear form uh, uh, which which is the image of x naught under a, right? So then a x naught power d one will uh, divide f is it? Right, where d1 is s itself, the way it is, you know, I have written down here how the d's are set. Now, if we apply the above claim to f is it, what we see is that, uh, you know, um, a x naught cannot have two variables or more variables because then the sparsity of the resulting polynomial f is it will be more than s, which will contradict our assumption. Hence, a x naught maps to a scalar multiple of some variable. Now, notice that permutation and scaling of variables don't influence sparsity in any way. So without loss of generality, and just for simplicity of discussion, we can assume that A x naught is x naught itself. Okay, now the second lemma. This is the, you know, the, the heart of the proof, this second lemma, right? So um, um, I'm running out of time. <laughs> I don't know whether it's uh, okay to take another five to seven minutes. Is that fine? It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, this is the main uh, lemma. After this, I think we will be almost done. So the second lemma holds for any a, right? So this lemma states something for any invertible a, right? It says the following: that you pick any invertible a, then the sparsity of q i is it, either which will be exactly equal to d three plus three, or there is a gap, or it will be more than two d three plus three. And not only that, whenever it is d3 plus 3, then A has a special structure. The structure is reminiscent of the forward direction, right? The, the, then A will look like this, that it will map all the xi variables to more or less itself and the yi variables to yi plus minus 1 power some Boolean variable xi, right? So, and it's an if and only if. Yeah, that's the statement. Uh, and what are these capital X and capital Y? They are uh, some scaled uh, variables, right? Of the, you know, of among the set of Z variables. Yeah, capital XI need not be XI, but we will be able to assume without loss of generality that capital XI is equal to XI just for notational simplicity. Okay, let's uh, see a proof of this. Uh, it's it's reasonably short. So, um, so we'll have three cases basically. Suppose sparsity of A xi is greater than or equal to two for some i, yeah? Then if, if xi maps to a linear form which has more than two variables, then notice that the first q i1 itself, yeah, here the sparsity will become d2 plus one, yeah, in the first q i1, because, you know, uh, yeah, so without loss of generality, you assume x naught maps to itself. That, that was the first lemma, right? So, um, although it's not such an assumption, is not necessary, but you know, it, it simplifies the understanding. Yeah. So that means sparsity of QI one is more than two D three plus one, right? Because D two is exactly two D three, and hence sparsity of QI, yeah, already the first one is taking two D three plus one. The other two will contribute at least sparsity one. So hence it is two D three plus three in this case. In the other case, we, we we assume that sparsity of A X I is one. Yeah, if it's greater than two, we are done already. Now, suppose 
the sparsity of a y i plus x and sparsity of a y i minus x i both are greater than two, greater than equal to two. If that happens, then the sparsity of these two polynomials after a acts on them will individually be greater than d three plus one. Yeah, why? Because you know when a acts on it. I get a linear form large with more than two variables. Here also, I get a linear form more than two variables. They're degree separated, right? So that the, the sparsity will then add up. So that will give us two d three plus two, and q i one will give sparsity at least. I mean, not at least exactly one because we have assumed x i maps to uh, as a variable, a scalar multiple of a variable. So even in this case, we get sparsity of q i is it larger than two d three plus three? So the only remaining case is that a uh, a x i has sparsity one and sparsity of a y i plus x i is one or sparsity of a y i minus x i is one. One of these two is happens. Right? Now notice that both cannot happen together because a is invertible. Yeah, both of them cannot be scalar multiple of it. So let's assume without loss of generality that sparsity of a y i plus x i is one. in this case that means a y i must look like some variable capital y i minus some variable capital x i what is capital x i capital x i is basically the image of small x i under a right where uh, we have already assumed that a x i has sparsity 1 so uh, capital x i and y i are some scaled uh, variables yeah so uh, so this gives us what we uh, want now if you see that now the a Looks like this: that all the uh, x i map to some capital x i and the y i map to something like this. Right? Because in this case, we assume without loss of generality that sparsity of a y i plus x i is one. If we had assumed that sparsity of a y i minus x i is one, then you would have gotten a plus here, right? So hence, uh, sparsity of um, the uh, q i one and and q i two. In this particular case, both are one, and Q i three, uh, it has sparsity d three plus one, right? Because it maps to capital Y minus capital X i. So all together, I get sparsity of Q i as d three plus three. So only in this case we get sparsity d three plus three, and this already proves one direction of uh, uh, this if and only if. The other direction is also very easy. It's it's actually easier. So I, let me skip that. Uh, the other direction says that if a is of this form, then the sparsity of q i is d three plus three. Okay, so that sort of finishes the proof of lemma two, yeah, and uh, that is the you know main lemma. Um, but now let's come back to our a. Our what is our a? Our a is such that sparsity of f z is less than f. The claim is this is the third and the final lemma, and this finishes the proof that uh, uh, that. If this happens, then sparsity of q i will be exactly d three plus three. Whereas lemma two is saying that if it is not d three plus three, then it is two d three plus. Uh, you say, look at here, two d two d three plus three. And if it is equal to d three plus three, then it has a has got to be of this form, right? So that means without loss of generality, I can now assume that my a looks like this, that it maps all the x variables to themselves. And the y variables to y i plus minus one power some boolean u i times six i, right? Without loss of generality. All that remains is to prove lemma three now, and to show that these u i's that I'm getting that forms a satisfying assignment for shy. Yeah, the hard work is done now. The hard work is to give a structure to A, and it 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 has already showed that shown that if uh, okay, let me come back to the proof later. It has already shown that if sparsity of f is it is less than f, then my a has to be of this form. Yeah, uh, modulo some permutation and scaling. Yeah. So uh, the proof of lemma three is also uh, easy. Let for contradiction, sparsity of some q i is it is not d three plus three, right? For some i. Then, by lemma two, sparsity of some q i will be d three plus three. So the sparsity of overall f is it 
must be n minus one times d three plus three plus two d three plus one, right? Yeah, there's a gross under. This is a gross underestimate here because I'm not even taking care of the. I mean, taking into account the the clause polynomials. So I'm just arguing with the variable polynomials. And this itself, if you just simplify, this itself gives you s plus one at least, which is a contradiction. So that means uh, the sparsity of all the QIs is it must be equal to d three plus three. Okay, so uh, the hard work is done that we have shown that in the reverse direction that if a is such that sparsity of f a z is less than s then my a looks like this the only thing that remains is to show that u which is defined as u1 to un the same u must be a satisfying assignment suppose not then some kth clause is unsatisfied and implying uh, that if it is unsatisfied then uj must be equal to akj for all j I remember that you know it gets satisfied if u j is not equal to a k j for some j in C k, right? Uh, otherwise, if the equality happens, then they're unsatisfied, right? Now, if u j is equal to a k j, now just plug in this transformation here, right? If that happens, then what would be the sparsity of r k j? It uh, you know all the a j a k j and u j are equal. There is no cancellation happening, right? Uh, and Characteristic is zero. In particular, characteristic is not two, so nothing vanishes. So it has sparsity at least two, and hence we get sparsity of the whole thing as d4 plus one whole cube. Yeah, that's a lot actually. Now this implies that the sparsity of overall f a z will be at least n times d3 plus three. Yeah, why d3 plus three? We have already shown in third lemma that it has got to be d3 plus three for the qi's, and If that unsatisfied clause R K, uh, you know, and the polynomial corresponding to that R K Z, if you take that, that will contribute a sparsity of D4 plus one whole cube. Now, if you simplify this, because D4 is chosen to be exactly M, right? If you just do this simplification, you get and S is chosen exactly like this, you get uh, a contradiction that sparsity of F Z is much less than, so which means that it is got to be a satisfying assignment. Yeah, that uh, finishes the proof. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think I'm going to stop here. I will uh, just uh, highlight one thing that in both the contradictions, you see, we are making gross underestimates. And in this case, also we just took one clause into account and not all the clauses. Right? If you do the analysis more carefully and if you sort of, um, you know, set the parameters a little more carefully, the d's. Then you also uh, get a gap between the yes case and the no case, and that leads to a hardness of approximation result, right? which I'm going to skip. Uh, it is there in the slides. The three, four slides are there, but I don't think I have time. So let me stop here. Uh, yeah, thanks. Be happy to take questions. Questions, sir. Yeah, sir. So the number of variables, number of variables, is very large, right? In the hard instances that seem to come out, right? number of variables where in it's F, large, right? In the uh, in the hard instances, in this reduction, uh, the uh, do, should we also expect hardness for like univariate, bivariate, trivariate? Oh, uni constant number of variables. Uh, constant number of variables, at least. Um, Uh, yeah. Um, so right. So I understand what you're saying. So you, uh, right. So let's say n is constant. That's what you're saying, right? Is the is the it is how hard is the it sparse problem for constant number of variables? Um, you can. Um, oh, is it like it can problem? Is it uh, a system of polynomial equations over constant? Yeah. Variables? Yeah. Exactly. You can apply polynomial solvability. Uh, and do something because the number of variables is constant, and for constant variate uh, polynomial system, sort of we know how to uh, solve system of polynomial equations. Although the dependency is uh, pretty bad in n, like double exponential or something, um, but still, if n is constant, you can do something about it. I have a, I have a question. So in these polynomials, suppose you were able to decrease the degree of x zero, would that buy you anything? Is that interesting? Or... Uh, decrease the degree of x zero. 
Yes. Uh, then what what happens? Would so, that buy you anything? Would that buy me anything? Yes. Uh, that's a good <laughs> question actually. Yes. So ideally, we would like to um, decrease all the degrees, and I would like to see a proof where all the you can you know um, the hardness result continues to hold when the degrees are all constant. Um, but if you are able to decrease the degree, whether it buys me anything, it might buy me something a little bit in the hardness of approximation. But in this hardness uh, proof, I'm not sure. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, yeah. Even in the hardness of approximation case, I'm not exactly sure. But you might. Uh, get some more constant factor improvement in the analysis. Okay. And the large degree part right now is used in this degree separable condition, for instance. Yes, yes. The large, the largest degree is D1. That but, is the, you know, um, yeah, bad part. Okay. And, you know, the uh, like uh, just at a high level, let me just tell you that that one third is coming because we are starting with three sat. The one third in the hardness of approximation. That three is coming there because every uh, clause has exactly three literals, uh, and there is a you know there's this D D four cube term that you will see here. Um, intuitively, that dominates the sparsity. So let me just give you the intuition at least. Like if you see uh, way back, uh, we showed in one slide uh, comparing the two sparsities. Here, uh, so the sparsity of F is like D4 cube, and the sparsity that we are uh, you know, shooting for is D4 square, right? So um, the ratio of, roughly the ratio of these two gives me the uh, uh, gap. Uh, so the yes case will have sparsity D4 square, and the no case will have sparsity very close to uh, the, this sparsity. So exactly D4 cube, it will have sparsity. So now if you take the ratio, the gap will be like D4. And D4 is like the input sparsity power one third. And that's how we are getting the hardness of approximation as well. Uh, so it, it kind of um, follows almost immediately from this process. Not question. Yeah, yeah. So, so what happens if you start with a hardness approximation result for three set? And do the LP hardness. So, so then what, so see, what happens? If you're satisfied, satisfiability versus unsatisfiability, if you start off with uh, satisfiability with a 7 over 8 satisfiability. Somehow I'm, I'm not so, hearing you clearly. So, if so you, you start the reduction, the, if the reduction is not from 3 sat, but from max 3 sat with 7 over 8. So, max 3 sat, okay. So, that three, whether we get Yes, whether we get something um, better in the exponent, one third in place of one third, yeah. is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Or, or in the degree, or in the relation yeah. between sparsity. That... Right. It's, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it might be possible, but uh, so I tried uh, using a PCP as it is, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and in our analysis, and that gave us only some constant factor improvement. Um, so instead of maybe, um, S power one third, you get some constant power times S power one third uh, hardness. It was not reflecting in the exponent of S. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not an expert in PCP, unfortunately. So it, maybe there are some uh, you know nice problem to begin with uh, to show this hardness as well, and that might lead to better exponents, and, and especially exponents very close to one. Yeah, the short answer is it's pretty much possible. I I don't know. More questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks for giving a talk. Yeah, thanks for inviting and uh, you know thanks for patiently listening and for all the questions. Okay. Thanks, sir. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.